everyone. I am Elizabeth Adams, and I am super excited to be here today to talk about AI and the Black experience. Just tell you quickly, quickly a little bit about myself. I am a native of Minnesota, Minnesota, excuse me, and I've been here um, for the last couple of years, really focused on AI, AI ethics, and what it means um, to the Black community. I am a Stanford University fellow, and my work is centered around race and tech. And I work with the city of Minneapolis elected officials, appointees, and commissions to kind of help them understand transparent technology. And we are working on some very exciting ordinances um, around public oversight of surveillance technology. So I am also joined by the great filmmaker, storyteller extraordinaire, technologist, Mr. Elton Glass. And I am so excited to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, and, and the grand welcome. To <laughs> yes. Well, I'm excited because while AI and the Black experience can be, you know, kind of large, I would want us to really kind of focus the conversation and kind of narrow it a bit on some of the impacts that the Black community are experiencing around AI, and also just to talk about the project that we're working on. Um, so I want to just kind of kick it over to you so that you could give us kind of an idea of who you are and what you've been working on and, and all that good stuff so we can get into the conversation. Okay, well, again, Alton Glass, thank you again. Um, I'm the co-founder of GRX Immersive Labs. Uh, you know, we're pretty much a, a my background is in storytelling, so directing and producing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really believe that the, in the power of the narrative. Um, and as we move into these new technologies, you know, that narrative is, is becoming an algorithm uh, into our technology. So uh, for me, um, we're, we're all about uh, research and development. We're a creative technology studio at heart um, and really just want to uh, continue to empower individuals to understand how they can leverage um, entertainment, education, and immersive technology. So we work with, you know, both filmmakers, revolutionary educators, and cutting edge technologists to, you know, reimagine what the world looks like tomorrow um, in, yes. in an empowering way. So that's what GRX Immersive Lab is all about. What we call DNA, our deep narrative analysis and, and taking technology to empower and build the world through that. I love it. I love that. And I was so excited when we connected because I have been focused, like I said, for the past couple of years on algorithmic bias and understanding what that means from a facial recognition system, specifically around the systems that have a hard time um, identifying black women or people of color. And then my evolution kind of moved into data policy, as I mentioned, working with the city of Minneapolis. And then recently, just as you just mentioned, reimagining what AI could look like in this immersive experience. And so um, tell us about this project that you're working on, POV. Um, how did it come about? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, POV, uh, it means essential points of view. And it, and it really focuses on how uh, narratives can shift for one and how technology can change our perspective. Um, and and it, the project initially started uh, when I was thinking about the Tamir Rice case, the young, I think, 13-year-old man, young man who was carrying a uh, toy gun. And I was thinking to myself, like, wow, what if uh, there was technology, uh, maybe a drone, an intermediary sort of technology that could have, you know, uh, came to that scene as a first responder and said, hey, you know, I need you to put this down. Uh, the police are coming. But instead, you know, they rolled up on it. And um, just, you know, unfortunately, they, right. they uh, took his life. So I was thinking about how could we use technology for good in a way that it could help us as opposed to over-policing communities, but be a sort of first responder. So that's when the concept for POV came to life. And I was fortunate to get a, um, a R&D, some R&D funding, grant funding from uh, Google and certain the foundations program, Thriving Cultures and Black Public Media uh, with the Gotham Foundation. And it was about, you know, how do we tell a narrative where, uh, especially about this young man who um, is uh, going on parole, and in the future, instead of giving him the ankle bracelet, they assign him a, a drone, an mm -hmm. artificial intelligence drone. So in this drone law enforcement program, he gets out on yeah. release and he's tracked. Um, and, you know, you see how our civil liberties are, are, are being sort of challenged with these surveillance technologies. But you also see how this drone is learning 
uh, behind the scenes with the police, with law enforcement. And then you see how this young man is also teaching his drone uh, a different side to who he is and that he's, he's more than data. He's actually a human being. Yes. Uh, and you see them build this relationship, this technology and this young man build this relationship. And then, you know, I can't give away the end, but yeah. <laughs> it is really designed to yeah. empower you to look at technology in a new way to empower yeah. yourself uh, and think of ways we can use it uh, for good in, in, in better ways. Well, you know, thank you for that, because I just think that that is so forward thinking. And I always feel a bit conflicted in the work that I do because I am a technologist. I do love technology, but I've also seen how technology can harm specifically, as I mentioned, communities of color, vulnerable populations, black, indigenous people of color. And that was part of the reason why I got involved with the work at the city of Minneapolis through the Racial Equity Community Advisory Committee. One of the first things I did, even on my application to apply before I was appointed, was to talk about technology and to talk about the transparency. A lot of the reason because of what you just mentioned, some of the overreaching. So it's exciting to me to think and pivot kind of to this immersive world because what I do on a daily basis is I don't get to, you know, get into that world much. I'm day to day working with city council, working with appointees, talking about why it's so important to pass transparent technology principles, right? Because without them, what we're finding and through our research, there's a lot of folks on the other end that are getting these technologies and they're using them to augment, you know, staff or, you know, maybe there are some police departments around the country that don't have as many police officers and so they're using advanced technology, specifically surveillance technology. Mm -hmm. And not everyone is trained and not everyone, you know, enters into that space without their own personal bias. And so it's just always been very hard for me. One end, I want to stay and make sure that we're doing the right thing from a policy perspective so that communities can thrive, which is ultimately what we want. But then also there's this way to kind of reimagine what it looks like. And so as part of your work um, and part of what we talked about, what do you think is important around the educational pieces so that we can dip into this world dip into this kind of futuristic kind of thing and then come back out possibly with a different kind of perspective. Because maybe through this world, we are actually putting ourselves in the position of someone on the opposite end of algorithmic bias or overreaching of you know, law enforcement. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I no, think- No, we're just dialoguing. It's yeah, just- I think yeah. it's, um, I mean, exactly what you said. I think it, it, you, the, the work that you're doing on that side behind the scenes is very imperative, right? And then the work that we do on the other side of the communities is, is making sure that we, we lower the barrier to entry to understanding technology, getting your hands on technology and, and inspiring you and say, oh, wow, okay, this is entertaining, but this is also real, right? Mm -hmm. so, and then building that community around unpacking that and having dialogue and then... Yeah like yourself being able to break this down and say hey now that you've had a chance to see and, and, and get an experience an immersive experience about this let me unpack this and let me show you what this really is under the hood but also yeah. don't be afraid of it here's how you can be involved in the areas that you can get involved in whether it's uh an, an industry itself right there's a lot of yeah. opportunities in the immersive space no matter how young or old you are um you know in order to uh, change and address some of these things. We do need more technologists, more programmers, more storytellers. And I think, you know, bringing those two worlds together and building a, a, a community overall around that from the community itself and the stakeholders behind the scenes, bridging that gap, uh, I think it's very, very critical. Um, it it you know, absolutely is. Change and, and see the, everybody's point of view on it. Yes. As well. You know, yes. we have to see, I have to understand the community, what their perception is. Absolutely. How it affects them. And, and we have to have that dialogue. And, and uh, what you do is, is, is great uh, because you make it so that it's digestible, it's understandable for both sides. Well, I think you do as well, which is the reason why I'm so glad that we are partnered in this work together with bringing in our own kind of gifts and talents you know, to kind of help people understand what is going on in this space. And you and I have chatted before, and we've talked about the evolution of AI and what's happened over the past couple years. And I explained to you in previous conversations that, 
you know, I was working really hard to make sure that we have more black and brown people in the decision making and as process and as influencers in AI. Because over the last couple of years that I've been a part of it, there haven't been many people that look like me. And I know that you guys and your team have gone to HBCUs, historically black universities and, and colleges, um, colleges and universities to take the message of immersive um, education there, as well as you have also some other programming. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Or not talk to us, but let's just have a conversation yeah, about sure. why that's so important, you know, to bridge this technology gap with the youth and even college students. Yeah, I mean, I think first, first and foremost, you know, the, the young, the generation now, I mean, they, they grew up in a world where their world was touch screen, right? So yep. they understand technology firsthand. So, and, 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 and what's exciting is when you can talk to them about um, um, looking at the things that they normally either consume or, or, or use on an everyday basis and then break down what goes into those technologies, right? They get really, really excited and they start to go on this exploration path of, wow, I can actually do that myself. Uh, so now you're talking about um, uh, younger generations who may be on the Fortnites of the world, right? Mm -hmm. and playing these Pokemon goals, but now they see it from a different lens as just not, just not only a cons consumer, but now a producer, a creator. And then teaching about AI is just one more step down, right? Okay. I think we lost it again. I think so. You're gonna have to edit that part. Yeah, that's okay. So you get them. Oh, you ultimately know. lost um, you so again. So for us, we have programs with, uh, you know, where, where you want me to start? You want to start from the programming? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, Sounds you, good. You, you yeah, add I me? can lead you in if you want. Go ahead. So we, you know, our paths have crossed in a number of different ways. And I know that you have spent some time talking about AI artificial intelligence at the education level with kids is also also with going to college campuses. Why does that work so important to you? Like, you know, what is it that you're finding that the kids are exposed to these days? Yeah, I think from the, from the younger generation, you know, I always uh, love that term where they say kids can't be what they can't see, right? So mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, seeing a, a black scientist, whether it's a woman or a man, right? You want to be able to show those types of characters, which is an example you know, why movies like Black Panther was so huge, right? Mm -hmm. People being able to see themselves leveraging technology in a very powerful way. So for us, you know, we have programs with Verizon Innovative Learning where we do these virtual career days where we take you uh, and you meet uh, individuals working in STEM, areas of STEM. So like Peter Ramsey, for example, who directed Spider-Verse, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a chance to shoot him in virtuality and bring mm -hmm his experience back to the community where the kids yes. like, wow, he made Spider-Verse and he's talking directly to me about how I can get into this and the different areas and disciplines. And then we have another one with Facebook and Oculus where we go out to the HBCUs and we teach them about immersive technologies, right? How they can leverage virtual reality. Um, how can they have leverage our, our augmented reality? And what you start to see is when they start to really understand this, they, they see how they can leverage it in other areas of their own career. So now we're hiring, we, we just hired a young man from FAMU. He was in an architecture awesome. design program. Uh, now he's working with us to build out these virtual reality renderings so we can see what our oh. experience will look like when we do our location-based experiences. So we're, they're seeing new opportunities for themselves and they're leveraging these new tools like Unreal Engine, Unity, uh, and they're building um, and yes. creating new opportunities for themselves. So that to me is very, very important, very empowering. Um, and sometimes it just takes one seed to plant to be able to open up that imagination. Yeah, and it looks like you're, you're planting a whole bunch of seeds with the youth. Um, this is what excites me about technology, honestly, Alton, is that the work can be hard, especially when you are talking about harm that technology is doing to certain communities. The work is hard because there's an education period, right? You've got to first off kind of help people understand what's going on, put them in your shoes. Then you can start from my perspective, start working on policy and all of that takes time and it's all can be very, very draining. But what holds me and what excites me is hearing about the things that can happen you know, that youth are being exposed to. And, and quite honestly, I'm super excited about 
about this work. And so I know we're talking about AI and the Black experience, and so I just want people to understand that there are many, many facets of AI and the Black experience. There's the stuff that's happening real time with surveillance technology and drones and aerial footage of protesters, and there's gate recognition, and that's AI that can talk about or that shows how a person walks. And then we have things such as Amazon Ring, which are cameras. Um, we also have a new concept to me, and Alton, you and I talked about this, which was heartbeat lasers, yeah, which pretty. is right, which is a vibration basically laser that can point at your heart and identify your unique cardiac pattern. So there are a number of things that are happening in our world. Is there um, anything you'd like to see differently from an AI Black experience perspective over the next six months? Would you like to see our community doing things? differently? I know I would. would. I, well, let me just answer that for myself first before you answer. I would like to see us get more involved. And I would like to see us get involved in our city and our state and our global community boards and commissions. I would like to see us take an active role in um, some of the things, some projects such as what you're doing, some STEAM projects. Um, and getting kids more involved in understanding what AI is. Because I think I mentioned early in this conversation, there's not many people that look like me sitting at the table. And while it is um, awesome, you know, especially with my work at the United Nations, and I appreciate the work that the United Nations is doing around digital cooperation, they're very, very engaged and interested. It would be nice to see um, you know, some other folks kind of step into this. And I think there's either a fear or people don't understand that really all you need to do is just bring your gifts and talents to the table. Just show up and start talking about the things that are of interest to you and follow your curiosity. Do you find that? Did you follow your curiosity? And what would you like to see differently in the next six months? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, the, the, the curiosity is what pretty much brought me into virtual reality. Um, it really, really opened my imagination to uh, the endless possibilities. And, and when I did my first VR experience, uh, Horizon is the uh, woman named Rose Catherine. She said, this could really be a great opportunity for kids to teach them about uh, all types of uh, opportunities in tech. And when it dawned on me, I said, you know what, if it, if it made me feel that way, Mm -hmm. I can imagine what it, how it could open up the minds of young young people. Yes. So uh, that that's very important. I, I, storytelling and creativity, you know, that's the capital that um, I think that we have to reach 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 into uh, to be able to get people excited about AI. Uh, because when you when you when you just say AI and you say artificial intelligence, yeah. yeah. When I was thinking about it, it was very intimidating. When you start breaking out terms yes. like learning and all these terms you know, in mathematics and all that type of stuff, it can, it can feel like it's way out there. Yep. But if we can, you know, find that, 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 that opportunity to just create the breadcrumbs, it, it, it gives yes. you a bite-sized pieces of exciting information that say, wow, okay. It's almost like when you take one step and, and, and you take another step, you get excited because you feel like, yeah. you're you know, yes. we can break it down like that, whether it be through entertainment, storytelling, um, and and, and it, I think that people will get more and more excited about it and, and they'll continue to do it. And, and we've been doing that at GRX and I'm looking forward to doing that with you. Um, with, with yes. Breaking this, this down and making this exciting and getting these companies yes. involved, right? Yes. You know, I think that the companies like the IBMs and the Googles and these companies who have built these types of technologies, you know, they do have these divisions where they're, you know, creating grant programs or for immersive tech and so forth. But I yeah. think we do need, what I imagine and what would be nice is to have, um, you know, more of these sort of um, community engagement experiences, sort of these, these mini hackathons, but attaching an educational component on the front of that, as opposed to starting everyone at the hackathon phase, where it's like you assume everybody yes. knows this already, but seeing when they understand what it is, giving them an opportunity to do some creative problem solving challenges. Absolutely. How could you imagine this technology could be used in your community? And I think that's when we can start to see their creative wheels spinning and how they understand tech storytelling is everything and technology is nothing without storytelling. And I yeah. think that would be very important. I agree. I agree. I think critical thinking is also an important part of the learning experience and giving people, whether they're adults or children, an opportunity 
to immerse themselves in AI, the Black experience, or just artificial intelligence in general, I think will help go a long way because I know that I spend a lot of my time helping people reimagine through stories by talking about my own personal stories and having something such as POV or something very similar, um, kind of giving them that basis for why, why this work is so important. So you and I have talked about AI, the Black experience, the immersive experience, and I know that we're embarking on a really exciting opportunity with this three city tour. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that at all, about why it's so important and what that means to get out into the community and, and help them have that experience with POV, yes. point of view, points of view? A wonderful uh, advisor and mentor, Regina Carson, uh, shared information with me about just how a lot of organizations are moving in that direction. And yeah. You also shared your profile, and, I, and when I did my research, I was like, "Wow, we have to work together, right?" Oh, and I just never that's forget awesome. when, when, when we first when we started talking about this and unpacking this, just the fire behind your passion behind it, right? And that's what we need, right? So, uh, another organization who I work with, Black Public Media, um, and uh, MacArthur Foundation, which we received a grant from them, and Certna, which is uh, the vision of that is called Thriving Cultures. They're all about uh, what they call radical imagination of justice. How do we mm. reimagine what justice can look like? And you mm -hmm. said it yourself, what does digital justice look like, right? Mm -hmm. I think this is a very big... We'll have to start again with digital justice. Okay. Yep. But how's it going so far, Mackenzie? I mean, I'm loving it. Part yeah. of that, especially... Oh, okay, Alton, we're going to have to start with we're gonna have to start with. So talk about digital justice, digital inclusion, um, groups that you're working with. Why is it so important that we start, you know, leaning towards digital justice and access and, and understanding? Yeah, so I mean, digital justice, I mean, is, is, is about your digital imprint and your access as well, right? What does your digital mm -hmm. citizenship look like for one? Or what does it not look like if you don't have the right uh, sort of resources, right? So we know that uh, today, even even the basic going out to try to get a job, you need the yeah. internet. You need internet for that, right? And as a result of COVID, a lot of people use libraries, and, and we don't have the library right now, right? So how do you right. keep them up to continue to keep their information coming in? They edu educating themselves. So that's a very big part. Just access alone can create very uh, big disparities amongst uh, individuals. But going back to the project itself, uh, I work with an organization called Crux. And they're really, really, uh, um, their focus is to create more diversity uh, and voices in the immersive technology space as a whole, mm -hmm. based on virtual reality storytelling. Because like you said, if you look at the startup industry uh, and virtual reality, there are very little um, um, companies uh, that have the type of funding that these traditional companies get just to go out and build immersive experiences. So yeah. we want to be able to um, we're collaborating with our partners with like Certna, uh, where they have a program called Radical Imagination for Justice through Thriving Cultures. And they want to make sure that people are empowering themselves through technology. And, and that's what we're all about. Um, and then we have um, uh, Google, who gave us initial funding as well, who is really, really passionate about the concept uh, in their VR lab. Uh, so it's, it's a combination of, of, of organizations that are really passionate about uh, moving the needle with uh, digital equity um, and also increasing um, the, the, the space for storytellers in the immersive um, technology space as a whole. Uh, because that's uh, the immersive economy is, a, is an industry, right? It's not yes. just one technology. VR is not a, a standalone thing. The immersive economy, I mean, includes artificial intelligence, you know? Absolutely. It includes augmented reality. It includes game development. You know, people don't know that, you know, they, they say that uh, the majority of um, a large portion of gamers are women. So, wow, need, I didn't well, know that. We need more of them to also develop games, right? How do yes. they create culturally and diverse uh, games uh, if they're not behind the scenes developing the things that they love as well? Yeah, this is such an exciting conversation for me because I love to reimagine what technology can do for our community. I love what technology can do and to reimagine what technology can do across the globe. And I've always felt like 
the African-American community, black folks. I've always felt like we had a place on the global stage. And it wasn't until I started getting involved in this work that I'm like, we really, really do. Like there are so many people who are interested in, you know, our voices. It just seems like sometimes the narrative gets focused on just some of the bad stuff that happens. And we do need to be you know, cognizant of what that is. And we do need action leaders in that space, which again, as, as I mentioned, is the reason why I spend a lot of my time there. But if you had a vision for AI and the Black community, the Black experience at a global level, where would you like to see us go? Even if we work together on a project, where would you like to see, you know, this go from a global perspective and getting other, you know, communities across the world involved? Mm, I would love to see uh, new startups, uh, new, start, new technology startups. Uh, and we know that, you know, when you look at, you know, how these startups are shifting and changing our world, right? You know, the Ubers and the Postmates and the, yeah. the, the GitHubs, like where we, we, I would like to see more uh, creators uh, building companies like that, you know, building the Pokemon goals, the socially uh, uh, conscious and, and connected games, um, uh, applications, uh, things that they can solve problems in the community, you know, like yes. LT devices and things that can help, you know, uh, deal with black health. Like, where are those tools? And I think that if we can get people excited and on a pathway, just open up that pathway. Yeah, yeah. It, it, will, it will start to open up those doors. And then building out the, you know, the financial infrastructure um, so that we can have these, um, these technology startups that could create uh, technology that could accelerate some, some great creative problem solving uh, with, that are, that are yeah. dealing with you know, a number of issues. Yeah, um, for sure. I absolutely love that way you frame that. And I'll tell you why, because part of my Stanford fellowship involves, it's three parts, it's a civic tech part, it's a tech insertion model that I developed for the black community. Basically, it's a litmus test. So as, as technology makes its way into our community, we should be able to check whether or not it's helping us thrive or harming us. But then the third part of it is this community resource um, command center, community respond command center. And it's basically based off of what has been done in Taiwan and how they have helped or have, how they have shaped their community around um, addressing the pandemic, COVID. Mm -hmm. And what they have done, Alton, is so phenomenal. They have involved pretty much, like you said, app developers involved in the community. So it's a whole civic tech process. So they have academia, they have health, they have the government, and they also have people who develop apps. So for instance, if someone knows that there's toilet paper somewhere or some other sort of community need, they have all kind of built this technology hub around their community thriving. And yeah. I just think that's such a fascinating concept and my intern is actually working on that. And as I mentioned, there's a technology piece, which is if you know something happens in Minneapolis and a fire or a flood or another pandemic, how could we support each other as a community, putting the community at the forefront, app developers, and anyone else who is leading in the space who wants to make sure that people are helped and taken care of? Um, where is that kind of a place for them? And so that was, that was something that I thought about. And I love the fact that you talk about these startups and what they can do and um, you know, how they can help us in society. Do you have any more advice for anybody wanting who who has a startup who wants to get you know further along or you know from your own experience? You know what? That's a that's a a big um, goal for for GRX is to build out more support uh, because that was something that I struggled with. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of um, mentorship in terms of when I first like mm. the, I first got my first business loan. Um, you know, I blew through it because I didn't have the proper uh, guidance on how to spend that money. And then when I got it back again, you know, I was a little bit smarter because I learned the hard way. But yeah. there were probably other things that I could have learned had I had the right sort of um, been in the right incubator or, or, or surrounded by the right team. Mm -hmm. So that was that was something that for me is really important. And that's what GRX is working on right now. How do we build out financial resources? Yeah but most importantly, mentorship around those resources, right? 
so that they can be good stewards over those tools because it doesn't necessarily take, you know, I've seen companies raise $100 million and they fall. We'll just start with um, companies raising, what did you say, a half a million dollars? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. right. But then I've seen companies raise. Oh, Alton? Yeah. Yeah, we'll just start with companies that raise a half a million dollars. So you had mentioned about companies raising a half a million dollars. Okay. Yeah, so I would say, I don't necessarily think it's always about how much money you raise. I think it's about a lot okay. of too about the, making sure you have the proper team around you that can help you uh, understand how to leverage those resources as well, right? Because you can get $100 million but not necessarily understand how to leverage that, right? Mm -hmm. And leverage your network, right? Because sometimes, like I mean, you talked about, um, a, a relationship could go way further than yes. a particular amount of money any day, depending Absolutely. on what that person brings to the table. Right. Yes. So having that mentorship around your resources, I think, is going to be very important, and that's something that we're working on actively, uh, because that was something that I definitely um, struggled with um, in, in my initial uh, growth of my business. Yeah. I had to learn a lot the hard way. So if, if we can build that out, that mentorship um, and those resources, um, and, and then collectively figure out how to bring together that capital, I think we'd be in a very good shape, in, because that's going to be the yep. basis of that community especially as it relates to African-Americans and uh, they call it BIPOC. Yeah, BIPOC communities. I mean, that is absolutely um, critical. So can we pivot it a bit? Because when you and I first connected, I, of course, did my research, which is, you know, what any smart person would do when you, you know, want to start working on a project together. And I was so impressed by this time project that you were working on. I'm not even going to say what it is. I'm going to let you say it and how it came about, because, again, this is so pertinent to the African-American story, the Black community story here. Can you talk about what that project is, how it came about, and its relevance to leading you to your next um, to POV and what you want to do next. Yeah, so uh, Time Magazine, which is uh, now Time Studios, which, with the division that I work with, um, they have an immersive um, division, and uh, they wanted to do a project um, on the 1963 March on Washington um, and deliver yes. the I Have a Dream speech. So you know, it was a really blessing and honor to be able to work with the King, work in partnership with the King of State to reimagine, you know, what um, that experience would be like if you could witness Dr. King give his famous I Have a Dream speech up close, you know, and personal. Yeah. Uh, with him. And there's this moment where he looks you in the eyes. This is so powerful where he transitions and passes that torch to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the experience, it takes you from, you know, it's, it's, it's an emergency exhibit in Chicago. It started off in Chicago at the DeSabo Museum, which is one of the oldest um, uh, historically black owned African-American museums in the country. And so we launched it there um, in Chicago. Of course, it hit its history with the movement as well. Um, it's very significant to one of the reasons we did that. But the project in itself is an immersive exhibit that takes you back in time, pretty much. Um, it's yeah. executive produced by Viola Davis uh, and also narrated yes. by Viola. So her voice, I mean, is just so empowering as she takes you through this experience as well. Yeah. And it's really about, you know, you get an opportunity to hear from uh, former civil rights leaders, uh, mm -hmm. Fred Gray, who was the attorney for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, um, um, Hank Thomas, who was a freedom fighter, uh, Reverend Webb, um, who was um, one of the young people at the, uh, during the Birmingham campaign, who was water hose. And you, you, you hear about the stakes that they had to deal with as they went in to uh, the 1963 March in Washington. Yeah. And it, it's really about showing you and giving you an opportunity to experience that everyone has a voice, yep. everyone has a light. And just because you're one person does not mean that you're insignificant. That one voice, uh, just like one, one match, can set a whole force on fire, yeah. right? And that's yep. the same thing with your voice, right? Yep. Uh, you can be a spark to, to change. You can start something in your community. And that's what that experience is about. But most importantly, in VR, it was about redefining and reshaping narratives because we yes. only learn, we, we, we typically learn about 
the civil rights movement through what they call the nine word problem. What, and that is Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, I have a dream, right? But there's so many nuances and there are so many unsung heroes that contributed to the March on Washington. And we really, really dive deeper into that with that project, yeah. give you a deeper, richer historical context to yeah. what that movement really, really took and how they mobilized to create some policy change and some really, really impactful change and, 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 a, and a model for a movement that we still use today. And, you know, I'm just blown away by that because I just see, you know, how AI and how immersive can continue to tell the stories for us as we are moving further into the digital age. And so being able to archive those stories and then present them in a different format for children, generations to come, I think is absolutely so powerful. And that is my hope for, you know, AI in the black community is that we do eventually move to more of a path where technology is used for good so we can tell those stories, right? And so that while kids might be missing stories about black uh, Americans or black folks in their history books, we can turn to an AI immersive experience and they can learn about black excellence through this experience. And also to your point before about a path for them and then see a path, right? Because representation matters. And that's why I am just so excited about the work you're doing. I probably said that like a gazillion times today, but it's okay, it's okay. I truly am excited. And, um, and I think I mentioned that to you the very first time we talked. I was like, no, I want in, I want in. I wanna take all that I know all the experiences that I've had and, um, and, and, you know, kind of merge that into a new future, right, of possibilities for AI and the Black community. And so um, I just want to find out from you, Alton, as we kind of wrap up our conversation. You do a lot. I do a lot. There's a lot going on in our world. What do you do for self-care? How do you take care of yourself so that you can get up every day energized to be creative, to think through what's next, to help your team, to lead your team, to coach your team? What do you do um, for self-care? You know, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> because but that's important. It's important. I'm, I'm, I, I am currently in a place right now where the word uh, restoration has been coming up. And foundation mm -hmm. has been coming up. So self -care, What was that? Restoration and what else? I'm sorry. Restoration and foundation. So building, okay. right? Yep. So that so that when you when you when you're when you're building something like we're talking about, right? Yeah. You have to have that foundation so you can step away and trust the individuals around you to continue to keep the mission going. So yep. for me, uh, I'm working on learning what that is by trying to understand how I build the right team how yeah. I restore myself and, and learn how to help um, uh, individuals, right? Um, and, and when I get to a place sometimes where uh, I'm exhausted, I just reach back into my, my network and I just, I just, I'm very open and transparent yeah. about that, you know? And I think just being honest and transparent that no man is an island, you know? We, yep. we, we can't do it on our own. Sometimes we feel like we gotta be Superman or Superwoman and I think it's okay to be vulnerable and say, you know what, yeah. I'm exhausted. And for me, that's the first part of self-care for me, just being transparent, honestly, like I got to throw in the yeah. towel for a little bit, yep. to take it back. And when I, and then sometimes when I'm not 100% and, and, and everything's are not clicking for me, yeah. I'll take a moment and I'll try to pour into somebody else's ideas. And that helps me recharge. Like, yep. wow, okay, boom. You yes. told me something you needed. I was able to help help you with that. That helps me get back in the line. So sometimes I get recharged. Yeah. My self care sometimes is just pouring in. Another, you know, um, yeah. that helps me a lot sometimes. You know, it gives me a recharge. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know for me, honestly, I have learned that I have to kind of step away because what used to happen to me is I'd be involved in like a hundred gazillion things. And I wasn't getting anything imparted back into me to kind of build up my energy. But what I've learned is that if I have, um, in, if my intuition tells me there are two or three things that I should focus on, 
and I do that, then I have found that I am much more joyful. There's much more purpose in the work and many more people can be helped. And I'm also to able, able to make connections. So as you said, other people can kind of step into the space. What I love most about kind of turning into this, turning this next phase of my career is really creating space for other folks to have a voice. And so that is my self care too. It seems like we both like to give, but I also will, you know, I'll pull back and make sure that what I'm doing is, is focused and intentional. And I actually think that's about it. I think this was such a fun conversation. Did you have fun, Elton? It was awesome. I mean, you know, you asked me some good, some great questions. You know what I mean? I, I love, you know, making, thinking, you know what I mean? I, I, I love that. So, you know, this is really awesome. And then like you talked about self-care, like you, you, when you, when you're moving in the right space, you, you get energized. Like, like yeah. I, could be, I could be in one space and then I get on the phone with you and then your energy, I just die, you, you, you just hand I off. feel the same way, seriously. That, that always helps, you know, to make sure, yeah. like you said, making sure you're in alignment. That yes. It's just, it's just constantly fueling itself. And you're like, where did yeah. I get all that energy from? <laughs> and I've been working 15 hours, but if you're in alignment, it, it, yep. you, if, you, it just feels like it's a part of you. Yeah. Um, so this was great. And we're going to see everybody in the community lounge after this. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Elton. All right, see everybody soon. Have a good one.